You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to yet another episode uh, of the Nailed It Ortho podcast. In particular, you're tuned into Citation Classics. We're talking shoulder and elbow, uh, Dr. Scantiliato and a future Dr. Sandler here. And uh, you guys killed it last episode. You know, really great episode. I, I was telling you, even after uh, listening to it, I went back and listened to it again and took some notes. So uh, you guys really crushed it. I'm really excited to see what we're going to talk about today. I know you guys have uh, some good classic articles to talk about. Um, so, you know, I'm a pleasure to be here uh, with you two and, um, and, and welcome back again. And I'll, I'll let you all kind of take us take us through, you know, today's citation classics on shoulder and elbow. Perfect. Well, it's awesome to be back. Thanks again for having us. Um, definitely like to thank future Dr. Sandler for all of her hard work and kind of helping uh, uh, carry the load for the past week and a half with uh, just me being a busy PGY4, her being a busy MS4, but um, she definitely uh, took the lead on this one. And I'm really happy with what we have here. So Alexis, thanks a ton for what you did. Oh, thank you, Dr. Scandaliato. I really enjoyed what being involved with this. And so thank you for all of your like guidance through this process too. You're going to be ready to rock next year. I think that some of our shoulder elbow staff are going to find that you are uh, unpimpable for the most part. So <laughs> it's, uh, oh, yeah. it, we'll be ready to rock. So uh, a little bit of a different topic today than last week, uh, just thinking about shoulder and elbow. Um, it's always a hot area of debate um, with regards to proximal humerus fractures and the ideal management and kind of why we treat them the way that we do. The interesting thing about this and putting together our reading list for proximal humerus fractures were that articles that I thought uh, were going to be really highly cited, specifically the Profer trial, did not make it into the top five. So uh, maybe we'll find a way to include that in future episodes because I think that um, operative versus non-operative um, discussion is really warranted. But regardless, we have some really great articles today. We're going to start with uh, Boileau et al. and talking about tuberosity, malposition, and migration and how they found that these are really... Uh, reasons for poor outcomes after hemiarthroplasty for displaced fractures of the proximal humerus. Then we'll go into what I think is like the coolest article of all time. Uh, and I think that our listeners and anybody who follows along or looks at our handout are going to agree to, and it's hurdle at all. And it's predictors of humeral head ischemia after intracapsular fracture of the proximal humerus. This is the classic Lego article uh, for those of you listening along. And if you haven't seen this article before, uh, you'll definitely see what I mean and what we mean in just a little bit. Then we'll uh, go into Gardner et al. and talk about the importance of medial support and lock plating of proximal humerus fractures. And then Booth Quinn et al. talking about reverse shoulder arthroplasty for the treatment of three and four, four part fractures of proximal humerus in the elderly. And then finally, Sue Camp et al. and talking about open reduction and tunnel fixation of proximal humeral fractures with the use of locking proximal humerus plates. Overall, and just looking at these articles that we have, you can see there's a few trends that uh, that kind of already come to light. Number one is that Boileau et al. really realized that things could go wrong with traditional either hemi or anatomic shoulder arthroplasty in uh, dealing with proximal humerus fractures and that there were a lot of technical nuances that really set the stage for poor outcomes. Hurdle realized that there were certain fracture patterns and types that were going to go on to develop either avascular necrosis or subsequent collapse. And we needed to be able to predict these to see which of those could be fixed potentially with open reduction or tunnel fixation. Gardner and um, Sudekamp really looked at what we needed to do with our plates in order to kind of guarantee pretty decent outcomes with open reduction or tunnel fixation. And then finally, both Quinn, uh, you know, we're going to present it in the middle here, but the paper builds off the first two in that maybe reverse is a better option than anatomic when it comes to treating these three and four part fractures of the proximal humerus in the elderly. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll add our commentary as we go. So I think without further ado, uh, we'll get started here. So I'll kick it off with uh, with tuberosity malposition and migration. So reasons for poor outcomes after hemiarthroplasty for displaced fractures of the proximal humerus. It's a prospective multi-center observational study published in the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery in 2002 by uh, Pascal Boileau, uh, Krishnan, Walsh, Coste, Mole, and Tinsi, some really, really big names, and they published this out of Nice, France. And the background for their paper were, was that although this um, common uh, procedure, hemiarthroplasty really yielded unpredictable results in the treatment of displaced proximal humerus fractures. So Surgeons were implanting these uh, fairly routinely. Uh, even still, though, they were really unhappy with the way that their outcomes uh, were panning out, especially in the mid to long term. In 1970, Charles Neer described excellent or satisfactory outcomes in over 90% of his patients who were treated with a hemi for proximal humerus fractures. 
However, no other studies since then, up until the time of publication of uh, Boileau et al. here, had really replicated these results. So the purpose was to assess the outcomes after hemiarthroplasty for displaced proximal humeral fractures and to identify the clinical and radiologic parameters associated with these disappointing results. This was a consecutive series of 66 patients. Their inclusion criteria were acute three and four part displaced proximal humerus fractures that underwent hemiarthroplasty, and they used the same non constrained shoulder prosthesis. Three of these patients had an unsuccessful attempt at reduction before the definitive procedure. Two had prior attempts at open reduction internal fixation preceding or during their arthroplasty. They had a mean follow up of 27 months, which ranged from 18 to 59 weeks. And you can see the breakdown of the fracture types here. Uh, 30 out of 66 were four-part, either displaced or a fracture dislocation. Another 21 were four-part with valgus impaction. Eight of them had four-part varus impaction, and then there were a few of these seven uh, to be specific that either were three parts with displaced greater tuberosity or three-part with a surgical neck and greater tuberosity displacement. All patients underwent hemiarthroplasty through a delta pectoral approach. They, say, they all received the same non-constrained implant so cemented in all patients. There were a few variants in terms of the uh, injury patterns in patients. Four of them had a longitudinal supraspinatus tear and they underwent a side-to-side -side suture repair. Five of these patients had glenoid fractures at the articular surface, but it was uh, such a uh, small fragment that they found these to be inconsequential and they uh, felt that it didn't really alter their surgical approach in any way. Nine of them had metadiaphyseal extension, so they underwent uh, cerclage suture uh, fixation in eight cases or a cerclage wire in one. And then two of these patients had um, you know, sub-tuberosity diaphyseal extension, and they had just underwent an extra long stem. For the tuberosity osteosynthesis, they used heavy non-absorbable suture and then cancellous bone graft from the humeral head. And 43% of patients underwent a concomitant biceps tendinosis. As we know, many shoulder and elbow surgeons are the apex predator of the biceps tendon. And even back in 2002, this uh, seemed to hold true. The results following hemiarthroplasty were varied. Excellent and good results were found in 15 and 16 patients, respectively. However, 22 out of the 66 had fair, and then 13 out of the uh, 66 had poor. You can see here the absolute constant score had a mean of 56. And the constant score, higher, uh, higher is better. So uh, we can see here that patients really weren't doing all that well. Uh, for their mobility and activity, uh, both of these subscores were, were fairly low, muscular strength was low, and only 58% of patients were satisfied or very satisfied. You can see with the uh, severity of pain at follow, uh, final follow-up, uh, a large amount of patients had um, uh, mild pain afterwards, which was rated at, uh, or 30, 30 patients had, um, had this mild pain, so that's 57.5% of patients. And we looked at the patients who were able to perform activities of daily living. Uh, only 38% were able to comb their hair afterwards. Only 56% were able to carry four to six kilograms of their arm at the side. 47% were able to use their hand with their arm above their head. And only 56% of patients were able to sleep on their affected side. So again, just like the authors kind of spoke about in their introduction and like we uh, covered here, we were implanting hemiarthroplasties fairly regularly. However, um, outcomes in terms of activities of daily living were still really poor. A minority of the patients were able to even comb their hair afterwards. And if you spend any time in a shoulder and elbow clinic, especially with uh, patients in, uh, you know, as they kind of move away from uh, work or certain sporting activities, combing hair really becomes a major complaint of a lot of patients. And it's surprising um, at first, but then when you really start to talk to patients, you realize that this is a major complaint for a lot of patients, just being able to do daily hygiene. So here, only 38% of patients were able to do this. They utilized a wide range of radiographic measurements. A lot of this is really um, in the weeds, but we'll touch on it just briefly here. Uh, they looked at first initial and final tuberosity in opposition. For initial, they said it was normal if the greater tuberosity was five to 10 millimeters below the superior aspect of the prosthetic head. We have detailed breakdowns in the handout that will be available uh, accompanying this podcast. And then finally, they said it was normal if the greater tuberosity was visible in neutral or external rotation on the last AP radiograph. The idea was that if the greater tuberosity was not visible, it had displaced uh, most likely posteriorly, so it wouldn't be visible in these neutral or external uh, rotation radiographs. Um, only 50% of patients had a normal uh, tuberosity final uh, positioning. So 50% of patients had some amount of greater tuberosity malposition at final follow-up. So again, 
uh, a large amount of these patients had something going wrong from the time of their surgery to the time of final follow-up. And we'll uh, touch on the importance of that in just a little bit. With, uh, with respect to tuberosity detachment and migration, 23% of patients had actual detachment and migration, which was observed after initial correct um, position in these patients. Three patients, so only 4%, had a reabsorption of their tuberosity at final follow-up. With regards to prosthetic height and humeral length, they looked uh, to see if uh, or they would compare the prosthetic to the contralateral side. And they said the normal was if the difference was less than 10 millimeters when compared to the contralateral. 26% of their, their patients had proud implants, 36% had low implants. With regards to the retroversion, they said it was normal if uh, uh, the prosthesis lied anywhere from zero to 40 degrees when compared to the transepicondylar line. And then greater than 40 or the, the retroversion was greater than 40 degrees in 39% of patients. Um, so uh, pretty, again, a pretty large number. And there were no patients, however, that had uh, excessive antiversion of their implant. With regards to proximal migration, they stated this was normal if a chromo humeral distance was less than seven millimeters. Um, they found that in 22% of patients, there was proximal migration. And this is normally a sign of a secondary rotator cuff injury, a rotator cuff tear, which leads again to proximal migration, decrease of your acromial humeral interval, and kind of uh, the in initiation of what we now know as rotator cuff arthropathy as the uh, humeral head kind of rides high. And then 10.5% of patients had periarticular ectopic bone formation. Uh, they said that there was a true scapular humeral bridge in two, but this had no correlation with functional results. Radiolucent lines around the prosthetic stem, which they stated was indicative of loosening of the prosthesis. They had a complete line greater than one millimeter in four patients, an incomplete line less than one millimeter in 16 patients. And they found that there was no radiographic loosening with the complete line over two millimeters. So the results and how they correlated this, with regards to the final tuberosity and malposition, either a high, low, or posterior greater tuberosity led to poor functional outcomes in these patients. With regards to malposition, if the height uh, with regards to the height, if the patients were shortened greater than 15 millimeters, they had decreased constant scores, but less than 10 millimeters was acceptable. Retroversion over 40 degrees did lead to poor functional outcomes for these patients too. So again, we see here that both for the tuberosity and the prosthesis itself, malpositioning of either the greater tuberosity or the uh, the humeral side of the prosthesis, well, it's a hemi, so the humeral prosthesis that's led to poor outcomes. They found that the malposition of the prosthesis, which led to tuberosity malposition, kind of called uh, caused what they uh, stated was this unhappy triad. So a high prosthesis with a retroverted prosthesis and a low grade of tuberosity really led to uh, uh, uniquely poor patient outcomes. And this was present in five cases. They had migration of the grader and uh, the prosthesis in all cases. And this led to persistent pain and stiffness for all five of these patients where they were just particularly miserable. They also found that for age and sex, women over 75 uh, tended to have worse outcomes. And they postulated that this was due to an underlying osteopenia that would lead to either loosening or potential migration of their prosthesis or just uh, poor bone stock that would kind of set the stage for resorption or migration. Three patients had neurological complications, all transient, all involved the axillary nerve. One patient had an anterior dislocation secondary, secondary to a fall 18 months postoperatively. It was reduced under anesthesia. The patient didn't want further surgery. Um, and that was uh, all we had with regards to follow-up in the paper. They concluded that overall functional results after hemiarthroplasty are directly associated with the outcomes of tuberosity osteosynthesis, which makes sense. We know that hemi and anatomics are powered by the rotator cuff. And if you have poor position or malposition of your greater tuberosity in particular, you're gonna have alterations of your, the biomechanics with regards to the rotator cuff. And if the cuff can't work, you can't really power the prosthesis appropriately. They, they went on to state that poor outcomes are associated with prosthesis malposition, greater tuberosity malposition, and in female patients over the age of 75 secondary to this assumed osteopenia. What made this special was that it, it really came to light that this was technically challenging to achieve satisfactory outcomes after hemiarthroplasty for displaced proximal humerus fractures. And they really offered a critical analysis of subjective technique and standard humeral prosthesis. At the time, a lot of surgeons were just eyeball positioning the humeral prosthesis. They weren't necessarily using tenderness landmarks or landmarks around the shoulder to determine the appropriate position of their um, implant. And uh, what may be obvious, they didn't have either navigation or augmented reality available to really dial in their prosthesis position. This led to humeral height and retroversion errors. And they recommended that there was some form of instrumentation developed to make this more objective as opposed to subjective. 
Also at the time, the prosthesis had excessive metal at the neck that complicated the placement of the greater tuberosity and really limited the healing of the greater um, into the kind of uh, metatophyseal region, or more specifically the metatophysis of the proximal humerus. This is interesting because this paper really sets the study for one that we're going to cover in just a little bit uh, with regards to reverse for proximal humerus fractures as opposed to hemi. We know that reverse through the inferior inferior or inferior position and medialization of the center of rotation, we get the deltoid powering the prosthesis as opposed to the uh, rotator cuff and tuberosity malposition really doesn't matter all that much for a reverse. We've shown that we don't need to repair the subscap and you could have a complete uh, massive multi-tendon rotator cuff tear and the functional outcomes for patients undergoing reverse are great. So this really set the stage as to uh, getting us to think is a anatomic type arthroplasty, either anatomic or hemi, um, where the rotator cuff powers it the best idea for these patients. So that's all we have for this one. Again, a lot of information. It's worth going through the paper to look at how they uh, determined all these radiographic parameters because it really is um, their attempt to objectify or um, make objective something which was once very, very subjective. Yeah, I think that was a great review. And you just touched on, you know, a lot of good points, especially there at the end, um, when you're, you know, talking about and looking at hemi versus reverse and you know how how you don't necessarily need a good functioning cuff for reverse shoulder arthroplasty to still have good outcomes. Um, but you do need a functioning deltoid or axillary nerve, um, you know, because we know that's one of the uh, ways that the reverse works is you kind of use it, your deltoid for your lever arm. Um, but no, I, I think great summary of this paper. Um, awesome paper um, and, and great job. This makes so much sense. I actually have a question for you about one of the radiographic measurements. Yeah. Um, I saw that this paper and a couple others that I came across both like in this series and outside both talked about ectopic bone formation. So they like a lot of papers seem like they take the time to record and analyze this data, but then they talk about in the discussion how there wasn't a lot of clinical significance in terms of patient function. Is there a reason behind looking into this or is it just what clinicians can expect to see on imaging or was it thought to impact function at some point? The way I break it down, the way I think about it is that if you do have ectopic bone formation that 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 can cause like a secondary glenohumeral impingement, it could potentially um, have adverse outcomes because any bone formation that kind of impacts the natural um, articulation um, of the the humeral head on the glenoid, or specifically if you have proximal migration in the um, humeral head with the undersurface of the chromium, if there is um, like ectopic bone there, it could impact because we're talking about either intra extra articular bone. But I think it's really helpful just to, like you had alluded to, in some cases, it's just um, a sequela of the surgery. And if it's there and we see it in X percent of patients, it helps you in counseling your patients, which is, you know, really important. We know, for instance, in like the hip, HO is fairly prevalent. Uh, we do prophylaxis against it. A lot of surgeons do. In some cases, it's symptomatic. In some cases, it's not. But at least it gives you data uh, through which you can counsel your patients and state, hey, your X months after surgery, you have this bone formation here. It doesn't seem to be impacting you. Excuse me. And uh, it, it arms you there. I don't know many papers that at least shout out at me as to where we've directly correlated like a certain threshold of ectopic bone um, with poor outcomes. But again, it, it may be something that just hasn't come across my radar yet. I just may not be, um, my eyes may not be fully open to it, but it's a really great question. Super interesting. Thank you. All right. Just because of the way that we broke down the papers, um, I'm going to jump right into the second one. I, I pulled rank on Alexis here because I think this is such a cool paper and uh, I, uh, <laughs> I had to run with it. So this is one that one of our shoulder elbow staff uh, absolutely loves to ask about. It's just an incredible paper. Um, everybody should read it. And it's the predictors of humeral head ischemia after intracapsular fracture of the proximal humerus. It's a prospective observational study, again, published um, in JCS. Uh, the lead author here is um, Dr. Hurdle, and it was done out of Bernie, Switzerland. The background for this paper was that fracture morphology likely impacted humeral head perfusion, which makes sense. We know that we have uh, potentially multiple contributors to the uh, intact vascular supply of the humeral head. And the thought was that certain fracture patterns had a higher likelihood of impacting the perfusion than others. They went on to state in their background in the background of the study that metaphyseal head extension that remained attached to the humeral head was thought to preserve, preserve the residual perfusion from the posterior circumflex humeral vessels and that fractures and fracture patterns that had a larger um, metaphyseal extension here, most likely we're going to have a higher likelihood of remaining perfused. Uh, 
So the purpose here was to evaluate how the position and size of the metaphyseal head extension affected humeral head perfusion. And they just opened the greatest can of worms in this paper as to figuring out what else impacted humeral head perfusion. So it was a consecutive series of 100 patients at uh, with final follow-up. They included patients who had intracapsular proximal humerus fractures, which were defined as any fracture with a component proximal to the surgical neck. Uh, these were all fractures less than 10 days old that required open surgery, and they wanted sufficient radiographic documentation in order to uh, fully assess the fracture pattern. They utilized a single expert observer to categorize their fractures. They used the following questionnaire to determine the classification of these fractures. This is a binary fracture description, and in the next slide, and we'll talk about it a little more, but they used five main questions to determine the basic fracture pattern. So is there a fracture between the greater in the head, the greater in the shaft, the lesser in the head, the lesser in the shaft, and then any fracture between the lesser and the greater? Then they had a few other accessory questions regarding head splitting, posterior medial metaphyseal head extension, amount of displacement, how large is the displacement, was there a dislocation? And what they came up with were 12 basic fracture patterns. And they used Lego bricks to break down the shape and um, or, or the pattern of these fractures. And when you think about it, you have a head, a greater, a lesser, and a shaft, four components, which can break into using their five basic binary questions into 12 different fracture patterns. It's, uh, again, just a brilliantly simple way to describe something that's infinitely complex. And um, we, we come across all these fracture classification systems in orthopedics, some of which are great, some of which are just simply academic in nature, and some have almost no application at all. And that gave us the basics with the five questions. And their accessory criteria are looking at the length of the medial meta, uh, metaphyseal head extension, the integrity of the middle uh, medial hinge, and if there were any head split components, whether it was a classic head split or a, a special type of head split. And you can see here, they broke the Legos down into more of a straight head split or a uh, Lambda type head split. And they drew um, just little cartoons to uh, really illustrate these. To determine perfusion, this was established interoperatively by observed backflow after centrally drilling the humeral head with a 2.5 millimeter drill bit. And they stated that they had positive perfusion in one of two uh, criteria whether we had clear uh, backflow while suction was applied to the base of the head, or in 46 out of 100 patients, they used a pulsatile laser, uh, laser Doppler to determine perfusion. So um, two different methods, but both uh, are fairly well verified and I think just completely fine for determining perfusion. Overall, 55 heads were ischemic and 45 were perfused, which uh, again, a majority of these patients actually had ischemic heads. You can see here what the most common fracture types were. So that was type seven and type 12. Seven was where the head and the lesser remained attached to each other, but you had a fracture of the greater in the shaft. And then type 12 was a true four part where you had four unique components, the head, the greater, the lesser, and the shaft. And you can see that for uh, type 12, uh, for instance, about 66% of these patients actually had an ischemic head. However, type seven, which had an attachment of this lesser and um, as a result of that, this medial metadapsal extension, uh, only about 20 to 30% of these were ischemic. Eight and nine, which again had detachment of this medial extension from the head component, you could see that they had a majority of these were um, ischemic. And then type 10, in which you had complete um, uh, diastasis of your lesser from your head, these were uh, uniformly ischemic. Again, limited by numbers, but we can see here that a pattern starts to emerge and that fractures with the yellow brick or the lesser uh, had a much higher likelihood of being ischemic. Um, they then went on to uh, analyze uh, statistically the uh, various uh, morphologic factors to determine which of these were predictive of ischemia. The ones that are statistically significant are highlighted in yellow, but uh, posterior medial metaphyseal extension uh, definitely predicted um, ischemic versus uh, perfused. And they found that this was right around eight millimeters. Displacement of the posterior medial hinge. So fractures that had, um, it was two millimeters of this, or um, uh, I'm sorry, 10 millimeters of displacement of this hinge had a much higher likelihood of being ischemic than those that did not have this um, amount of displacement. And finally, displacement of the tuberosities was also found to be a uh, predictor of eventually humeral head ischemia. The results were if you combine anatomic neck, a short calcar segment and a disrupted hinge at a 97% positive predictive value of eventual uh, uh, humeral head ischemia. 
And if you uh, broke down in their statistics, they stated specifically a short calcar segment, so less than eight millimeters attached to the humeral head and more than two millimeters of medial dislocation of that hinge, so two millimeters of displacement, were both strongly positively predictive of uh, humeral head ischemia. They did, however, find that a head split component, glenohumeral uh, dislocation, displacement of tuberosities, displacement of the head, these were not as predictive as those uh, first two criteria. They also found that uh, specific fractures with regards to the anatomic neck were also predictive of eventual ischemia as well. They concluded that the most relevant predictors of ischemia, and these are the classic PIMP questions, it's on, uh, I believe, orthobolts, it's on the, um, uh, the pocket PIMP handbook, it's all over the place, but it's these three. The length of the dorsal medial metatapsial extension less than eight millimeters, integrity of the medial hinge, so more than two millimeters of dislocation, and then their basic fracture types as classified by a binary description, descriptive sim, uh, system, specifically the ones in which the lesser is displaced are all predictive of ischemia. The degree of fracture displacement is actually less important than previously thought. Um, it would make at least sense upon kind of first diving into this topic that the more displaced a fracture is the higher likelihood uh, of eventual ischemia it would be. But however, this, this does not hold true here. If there is not a ton of displacement between the lesser in the head or that medial metaphyseal segment in the head, uh, it's unlikely that uh, you're gonna have ischemia, even if you're greater in your shaft or uh, are fairly well displaced. There was also a prior overemphasis in the dominance of the anterior circumflex vessels. Um, they found that the perfusion from the posterior circumflex vessels alone appeared sufficient for head survival and that you did not actually need uh, a predominant anterior uh, vascular supply in order to keep the head perfused. So what makes this special? Uh, it's identified an easily ascertainable risk factor for humeral head ischemia this questioned the vascular predominance of the anterior uh, circumflex vessels with regards to the humeral head. And finally, it demonstrated that a binary fracture descriptive uh, symptom or system is straightforward and actually has clinical value. This starts to build upon uh, what Alexis will cover in that certain fractures can be treated with open reduction internal fixation, but eventual ischemia or collapse is a major risk factor of certain uh, certain fracture patterns and certain fracture types. So when you start to make a surgical plan for these patients, you not only have to consider uh, the patient's potential underlying osteoarthritis, their bone quality, their degree of injury, but also is this femoral head going to remain perfused down the road? And are you going to actually have solid bone in which to perform osteosynthesis? So this builds really nicely towards uh, some of our future papers. But again, uh, it's a great way by which we can now predict fractures of the uh, humeral head, which will eventually become ischemic. And the best part is they use Legos to break this down. Something so <laughs> simple that, you know, uh, you, you could, you could present this to a, a group of fourth or fifth graders with a, a skeleton of the proximal humerus and Legos and tell them that, you know, fractures that involve this do bad. These other ones do good and show them radiographs. And you could probably get a group of young kids to start to accurately predict which of these are going to go on and if you told them die versus live in terms of the bone, I think that young elementary age children could probably figure it out, which to me explains why this is just such a highly quoted paper, highly cited paper, and just, I think, such a fun one to read through and, and kind of digest like this. Yeah, yeah, I, com I completely agree. And yeah, those Legos, I mean, that, I mean it's brilliant, great, um, a great way to describe these fractures. And I think you, you hit the nail on the head there at the end, as far as, you know, this is something that can predict humor head ischemia and also something that you can counsel your patient about, you know, and you can let them know, you know, you know, the fracture that you have has a high, you know, likelihood chance that, you know, that this may not heal. We could still try to, you know, put it all together and, and, and line it up and fix it with plates and screws and hopefully that everything heals, but you know, you, you have a fracture type or a pattern that may um, lead down the line that you may need another operation, you know, and, and, and again, I think it's a good thing to know, to counsel patients, especially preoperative, you know, if you kind of let them know before they have surgery, some of the risks, um, then if one of those risks or one of the things happen, you know, they, they, remember, they may remember that you told that to them. So I think part of that kind of just goes into a, a being, I guess, kind of the art of being a, a doctor. And uh, another one of the things that you mentioned is, I think before this, again, one of the big things was that the anterior circumflex uh, humeral vessels were the main ones or the ma main blood supply to the humeral head. But, you know, now this, this patient, this paper, you know, we're kind of thinking maybe it's a posterior circumflex vessel. So um, great paper. Um, you know, I really love the Legos and, and great review.
Yeah, definitely love the Legos too. I think I'm probably going to need to start carrying around like four Legos in my pocket or something. I saw the authors thanked Lego at the end of the study and I feel like we all need to thank Lego too. Uh, Another thing that I think was really cool about the 12 pattern system and how the authors manage it statistically is they took like the initial binary process to make the 12 patterns and then divided the 12 patterns anatomically to make it clinically relevant too, which I think is really cool. And there's so much overlap between the which patterns are included in which anatomic categories, but it looks like it makes it especially meaningful. The anatomic neck group had more significance in calculating the positive predictive value in the other categories. I thought that was really a cool way to do it. Yeah, to add on that too, they the authors talk about it in the paper, but Kahneman in some of his original anatomic drawings, I think they said it was from the 30s and 40s, he saw this. He saw these basic fracture patterns um, I've tried to get copies of some of those original manuscripts and breakdowns, but they're uh, really prohibitively difficult to find at times. But um, he had predicted this. He saw the writing on the wall and knew that certain fracture types and that certain fracture patterns were going to go on to do worse. But more importantly, he saw that, that when you have a fracture of the proximal humerus, it really comes down, excuse me, to these major components, the greater, the lesser, the head, the shaft. And uh, that's how your fractures are going to occur. And then we know that, of course, we can classify with the part system for proximal humerus fractures, but it's all built into it. But again, a fracture classification system that, in my humble opinion, is a PGY-4, but a, a classification system that either doesn't drive outcomes, drive decision-making, or drive clinical research really isn't that helpful or worthwhile. They ha- there has to be an underlying reason for why you classify something. Um, and this is one that I think is just... I don't want to say perfect because nothing's perfect, but it's really close to it. Um, you can use four colored blocks, uh, break this down to how the fracture looks radiographically, and then completely or with it or close to completely be able to predict the outcomes that your patient's going to have with regards to ischemia, which then helps you decide, do you do a head preserving procedure? Do you do a, an arthroplasty or a head replacement procedure? What are their likelihood of developing ischemia? What are the patient factors? Can they tolerate uh, osteosynthesis with the secondary um, head replacing procedure? Or are they a poor surgical candidate that really taken the surgery twice? And then in patients, uh, you know, once we start kind of going in the future, and then we look at the results of the PROFER trial, operative versus non-operative, this is something that I think is really important in how you have to decide whether or not you you offer a patient surgery aggressively or not aggressively. Uh, if there's a high likelihood of their fracture patterns going to go on to develop ischemia, and you have a patient who at that time is healthy and potentially amenable to surgery, maybe you're a little bit more aggressive with that patient. But alternatively, if they're sick and frail, and uh, or they are uh, poly traumatized, or they're you know hooked up to uh, road a bed or whatever it may be, but they're sick and they have a, a low likelihood of going on to develop ischemia, maybe give them a chance on operatively and then treat them secondarily down the road if they do develop ischemia. So again, um, you, you definitely uh, started to pick up like why we use fracture classification systems and, and you know, that kind of, you know, thought about it as a MS4 is uh, definitely ahead of your time for sure. All right. So moving into the first of the locked plating studies. So this is the importance of medial support in locked plating of proximal humerus fractures published in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma in 2007 by Gardner et al. So for some background, there was growing interest in using locking plates for proximal humerus fractures given their biomechanical advantage in osteoporotic bone. But because of the vasculature around the medial aspect of the proximal humerus, plates need to be positioned laterally, which creates a challenge in that the fixed angle screws sit perpendicular to the humeral head of the fragment and have to kind of like be like a strut. Uh, And in this position, they'll be subject to the forces from the rotator cuff causing varus displacement that is only worsened without any sort of medial support. So the purpose of this study is to evaluate how the radiographic behavior of proximal humerus fractures um, and understand how different variables like patient factors, fracture patterns, reduction, and implant placement affect mechanical stability. So for methods, uh, this was a prospective observational study and it included a consecutive series of 35 adult patients with acute traumatic proximal humerus fractures that underwent ORIF with a locking plate. So of these 35, 15 were three-part and 14 were four-part based on the near classification. And there were six two-part as well who were indicated for ORIF due to 100% displacement or varus malalignment with medial cortical comminution. The average follow-up time was seven months. So for surgical technique, either a delta pectoral or anterolateral acromial approach was used. The rotator cuff was secured to the locking plate holes using non absorbable suture, and at least five locking screws were placed into the proximal fragment for all patients, 
In a handful of younger patients too, an additional one or two compression screws were used to assist reduction. There were two main radiographic measurements. The first was humeral height, which was the distance between a line drawn perpendicularly to the superior edge of the plate and the superior edge of the humeral head, which is highlighted in yellow on the slide. And the second was medial support of the proximal humeral head fragment, which was either classified as adequate or inadequate. So to be adequate, there had to be one of three findings. So first, the medial pillar was anatomically reduced and non-comminuted, which is shown in the image on the slides. Uh, second, the humeral shaft had medialized and impacted into the head fragment. And third, an oblique locking screw was present in the inferomedial quadrant of the proximal humeral head fragment to within five millimeters of the subchondral bone. And that's also uh, shown on the slide here. So getting into the results, 18 patients were classified as having adequate medial support while 17 did not. So we're almost 50-50 here. Of those with adequate support, nine met the anatomic reduction criteria and six had one or two inferomedial screws. Malreduction was the cause of inadequate support in 12 patients and medial comminution in the remaining five. It's really important to emphasize here that no patient in this group had a screw placed in the inferomedial region. So in comparing the groups further, uh, inadequate medial support was a significant predictor of a loss of fracture reduction. There were also significant differences in the two groups. So at a baseline, average age in the adequate support group was 55 compared to 69 for the inadequate support group. So already we have, we can see that uh, there are worse outcomes in the older population. But beyond this, there were differences in the change in humeral head height, loss of reduction, and rates of both screw penetration and screw loosening between the two groups with consistently favorable results seen in the adequate medial support group. And even kind of on top of that, a subgroup analysis by confounding variables showed that the humeral head height remained consistent between three and six month follow-up. And it really only lost like 0.3 millimeters on average. So this shows the humeral head height should not be decreasing exclusively with time progression. There was some other sort of factor in here. So the adequate medial support group had only one complication, which was an inferomedial screw that penetrated through the humeral head and required revision at three months. The inadequate support group, on the other hand, had a total of seven complications, five of which were screw penetration into the articular surface. There was one revision uh, to a longer plate due to screw pullout and another with persistent drainage that required IND. So in terms of conclusions, um, sufficient mechanical support on the medial aspect of the humerus is critical to maintaining a good reduction after locked plating. The authors really emphasize that laterally placed locking screws alone cannot stabilize the medial column. And because of this, the criteria that determined adequate medial stabilization must be met, specifically an anatomic reduction that allows cortical contact and inferomedial screw placement, keeping in mind that none of the patients with inadequate medial support had an inferomedial screw in place. And kind of just like for an aside on the inferomedial screws, so blade plates, which I am currently learning about, uh, had not been extensively studied at the time, and they were showing a high rate of blade penetration into the humeral head. However, you, a 90 degree blade plate on the other hand, and that has better purchase into the inferomedial region, just like these inferomedial locking screws, actually brought the penetration rate down to zero in a study that the authors include in the discussion by Hinterman et al. So this really emphasizes how critical the inferomedial region is to achieving good results in plating. And then moving into what makes this special, um, first off, it offers a lot of insight into the role that locking plates can play in proximal humerus fractures, especially given how likely these patients are to have osteoporotic bone. Uh, but beyond that, it really identifies the, like, the really vital mechanical requirements, mostly the anatomic reduction and ferromedial screw placement, that kind of set like a specific standard that you can use to achieve stable fixation. Yeah, I think that's a, just an amazing outline of this paper. And again, I love these studies where specific fracture patterns are broken down biomechanically. And what comes out of the study or the paper or group of paper is that there are one or two key surgical techniques or criteria that need to be met. Otherwise, it completely you know, tips the scales the other direction or in the favor of a poor outcome. And um, we always talk about um, you know, calcar support uh, for the proximal femur. Um, there has been talk of a calcar for the proximal humerus. I know that um, there's been some uh, words exchanged on, on Twitter and in, in jest and in um, uh, discussion about how you can't just call an area of you know dense bone in a certain location a calcar, whether it's a distal radius or the proximal humerus. But what we're finding here is, like you said, this, this inferomedial region here is so critically important to maintaining the stability of the head on the neck of the proximal humerus that this requires uh, really 
good stout fixation. And that locking screws alone, which we think, oh, osteoporotic bone, um, you know, maybe, or especially humeral head bone, maybe that locking screws are going to uh, allow us to get uh, better purchase. But, but really here, it just, it's destined to fail unless you get cortical uh, screw kind of in that inferior medial fragment. And then the importance of an anatomic reduction. And what I thought was really um, pretty profound when you brought it up was that just the rate of complications in these patients who were just lacking one basic biomechanic principle and that it wasn't just, oh, there was failure of fixation, but there were multiple complaints and even one that uh, went on to have, you know, the persistent wound drainage. And uh, again, it may have just been uh, coincidental, but it's also possible to think that in the setting of um, inadequate mechanical stability that you're setting kind of this biologic, biologic milieu where you could go on to develop a you know, hyperinflammatory state or just a state of uh, where you are lacking stability. And this leads to um, just kind of um, stress at the fracture site and a reaction at the fracture site. So again, uh, really, really interesting paper. And you, you definitely nailed the, the outline of it for sure. Yeah, you definitely for sure nailed that. Um, and it was, you know, great outline of the paper and, and just another point to bring up too. And sometimes in cases when you have, you know, a lot of medial combinations, sometimes just to get that, that medial support, you may use some type of fibula uh, allograft strut, um, to kind of give you that cortical support on the medial side. Cause you know, that's just how important, uh, this medial support is, uh, and when you're fixing these different types of, uh, proximal humerus fractures with different morphologies, but again, great, great, uh, great overview. Um, great, um, great paper and good job. Thank you. That is super interesting too, huh? Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. So, and, and, you know, even again, they, they had stated that even some impaction medially was okay. Like you don't disimpact and it potentially knock out your medial support, but you use that impaction in kind of your surgical plan. And it's something I could see, you know, before this paper came out and before people really started looking into this, you know, you disimpact it, you do it, but in this case, potentially a little bit of impaction with good cortical contact in here immediately is really all you need to start setting the stage for a successful uh, eventual fixation and, um, and osteosynthesis. All right. So now we can talk about uh, what is my favorite surgery um, uh, in the world, the reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So uh, this is uh, a wonderful paper. It's a reverse shoulder arthroplasty for the treatment of three and four part fractures of the proximal humerus in the elderly. It's a prospective uh, observational study published, um, by Bufquin et al. This was out of France and you can see a lot of shoulder literature does come out of Europe, um, just due to the, the implants and, um, just some of the, the great thought leaders, um, uh, in Europe, specifically Germany and Switzerland and France. But, uh, this was, uh, published in JBJS and, uh, or, or the, uh, JBJ in 2007, and um, the background here was that there was a high risk of avascular necrosis in three and four part proximal humerus fractures, which uh, the authors postulated rendered reverse shoulder arthroplasty as a reasonable treatment option. Uh, if you've been listening along, this comes as no surprise. We've seen that with hemiarthroplasties, there is the high risk of tuberosity malposition. And then in the hurdle paper, we know that certain fracture patterns are almost destined to go on to develop ischemia and eventually uh, uh, avascular necrosis. So we're going to take a little trip back in time. So 2007, uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty showed promising midterm outcomes in patients with degenerative or inflammatory shoulder disease, and it was beginning to show acceptable midterm outcomes in trauma patients. So uh, Boileau in 2006 and Cousin Wave in 2006 all both published outcomes of reverse shoulder arthroplasty in trauma patients, um, specifically how you uh, kind of obviated the need of tuberosity fixation and an intact rotator cuff in order to power the prosthesis. So the purpose here would describe short-term outcomes after reverse shoulder arthroplasty for near three and four part proximal humerus fractures in patients over the age of 65. This is a consecutive series of 41 patients over 65 with proximal humerus fractures. Five patients had a three-part fracture, uh, 38 patients had a four-part fracture, and then 12 of these were an associated fracture dislocation. They excluded patients with an active infection and axillary nerve palsy. As Dr. Cole mentioned, you need an intact axillary nerve to power a reverse deficient deltoid musculature, and then the presence of a bone tumor. And they had a mean follow-up of uh, 22 months. For the surgical technique, it did vary a little bit throughout the uh, paper or the study period. They utilized a superior lateral approach in the first 20 and then changed to a delta pectoral approach in the, uh, in the uh, remaining 23 patients. 
The glenoid uh, basate was implanted flush to the inferior rim with 10 degrees of inferior inclination, and this was secured with uh, four lag screws. The humeral component was initially patient uh, positioned in retroversion, but then converted to uh, neutral version to uh, increase internal rotation. And then uh, they utilized epiphyseal augmentation to improve the tensioning of the deltoid um, in 15 uh, patients total. They uh, utilized a few radiographic measurements, specifically the center of rotation, the medialization, and the inclination. Uh, they did go into details as to how they um, uh, measured these, but they stated that the center of rotation was considered inferiorly depressed if there was a 10 millimeter difference um, relative to the natural center of rotation. And then similarly with medialization greater than 10 millimeters, and then in inclination was an angle at the intersection of the lower scapular border and the vertical glenoid axis. Things that we've come to know or now know are important in positioning your uh, reverse arthroplasty, specifically with some inferior tilt uh, and medialization in order to uh, uh, impact or improve your deltoid lever arm. So what makes this awesome, at least in the results, the clinical results were not affected by the approach or the healing of the tuberosities. Something that we had shown in the uh, first paper we covered in this uh, podcast was that healing of the tuberosities for hemis, uh, if they did not heal, you had disastrous outcomes. But for patients who are under getting a reverse, uh, tuberosity healing really didn't matter. They had a mean medialization of 21 millimeters uh, when compared to the non-injured shoulder and a mean center of rotation of nine millimeters uh, when compared to the um, uh, contralateral shoulder, specifically a uh, inferior, inferiorization of the uh, center of rotation. Uh, what's really awesome here is that you look at the DASH score uh, was uh, equivalent to the non-injured extremity and then their constant score for pain, 15 is the best score you can get here for the constant, zero is debilitating pain. Uh, pretty pretty darn close. Um, I, I don't have the minimum clinical important difference off the top of my head for the constant pain, but I suspect that these uh, may be well within that parameter where this is not even perceived as different between the two, um, the two scores. They had secondary displacement in 53% of patients who did have tuberosity fixation. It was a malunion in five and a nonunion in 14. They had scapular notching in 10 shoulders, which is kind of that inferior wear of the, uh, of the uh, scapular or the glenoid neck and the scapula uh, underneath the base plate. It was generally noted within the first year and did not worsen by the end of the second. Um, they had an average inclination of 15 degrees greater than the contralateral with no correlation with the grade of notching uh, with regards to their inclination. And then 90% of patients did uh, undergo some degree of heterotopic ossification. Five patients had neurological complications um, with uh, two patients having residual finger paresthesias as a final follow-up. Three patients went on to develop RSD, which resolved spontaneously. There was a glenoid fracture in one patient, secondary to reaming, which was treated with a revision base plate. This is just a, a technical pearl that I've picked up from one of my mentors where he had told the story of a, a resident he had uh, a few years ago who, when he went to ream the glenoid, he started with the reamer on the glenoid and it just completely sheared through the glenoid and the scapular neck. So oh, uh, no. for those, yeah, for those uh, younger, younger <laughs> residents or those who have not done a lot of reverses, start your reamer off the glenoid and then slowly introduce it on. So you're not going from zero to sheer uh, directly on what could be weaker bone. It's something that I uh, haven't forgotten since that story, but it was funny that even here in this uh, older article, um, uh, I'm hoping it was not some poor resident in uh, Angers, France, who did this. <laughs> um, there was a non-traumatic anterior dislocation in one patient um, who declined further surgery and a chromial fracture in one patient uh, who went on to heal uneventfully. And then there was a uh, deltoid dehiscence in uh, one patient who underwent a revision at 17 months. And this is another technical pearl is really getting a good repair of your, uh, of your deltoid back to, to prevent uh, deltoid dehiscence. Because as you see here, a uh, few of these complications either resolved on their own or patients tolerated, but deltoid dehiscence, especially in the setting of a reverse, patients just do not tolerate well. So they concluded that just like anatomic procedures, uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty provided excellent pain relief for treating proximal humerus fractures. They found that in patients over the age of 75, they had a potentially improved functional recovery and that patients from 65 to 75, they had um, uh, biomechanical, or biomechanical medialization and inferior displacement of the shoulder center uh, did reduce the consequences of a failed tuberosity reconstruction. Um, we knew that the biggest challenge uh, for anatomic arthroplasty was a fixation of the tuberosities in an anatomic position, which was the main prognostic factor influencing the recovery. For reverse, however, tuberosity position just 
really didn't matter all that much. We know that it's powered by the deltoid. We've even come on, uh, or we've come to find in newer studies now, specifically in 2019, 2020, that even repairing your subscapularis doesn't even uh, improve functional outcomes for these patients. So as long as you have a good appropriate position of your uh, component uh, with attention paid to your center of rotation and your glenoid base plate positioning, you can really get patients excellent outcomes with a reverse for displaced three and four part proximal humerus fractures. None of these complications cause any major problems uh, too, which is also promising. Some procedures can get patients good outcomes, but they're at the expense of a really uh, increased risk or risk of poor outcomes. But here, the complications we went over, almost every one of them were either treated with a secondary surgery that the patient recovered well from or the patient tolerated. And then they had similar rates of transient neurological complications as seen in prior literature. So what makes this special is it's one of the early paper, or earliest papers reporting outcomes of reverse shoulder arthroplasty or proximal humerus fractures with outcomes comparable to anatomic shoulder arthroplasty. that they found in certain patient populations it may offer improved recovery and biomechanical advantage for certain patient populations. We know that patients over the age of 65 about, you know, you can quote the literature as you want, but I like to say about 50% over 65 have a rotator cuff tear, uh, whether it's symptomatic or asymptomatic. And we know that either tuberosity malposition or uh, rotator cuff deficiency will drive poor outcomes following an anatomic or a hemiarthroplasty of the shoulder, unless you use a, a cuff tear type implant, which um, has kind of fallen out of favor recently with the um, continued progression of the reverse implants. But uh, for these patients here, nothing would be worse than doing an anatomic or a hemiarthroplasty, really paying attention to get your tuberosities fixed appropriately. And then the patient come, goes on nine or 12 months after surgery to have a sharp increase in shoulder pain consistent with the progression of a cuff tear. And then suddenly they can't power their prosthesis anymore. And then you're revising them uh, to a secondary procedure. And I imagine, especially in the mid to late 2000s or you know the first decade of the 2000s that the um, availability of either, you know, uh, stems that you could use in a revision setting or revising these to a reverse probably wasn't as elegant as it is today. Um, something too that's important to note is that while the PROFER trial, which was comparing operative versus non-operative management of patients, um, reverses were not included in the operative uh, group in the PROFER trial. There have been some smaller randomized control trials to date that are looking at um, non-operative versus reverse for proximal humerus fractures, but uh, that study is cited, but it's important to note the limitations of that study, especially uh, to the medical students and younger residents that a big limitation to that study is that reverses were not included um, in the surgical technique. So uh, again, Great paper. I can see why it has, I think, over 600 citations or something, but really starting to um, kind of push us towards thinking about uh, the work of Hurdle and the work of um, the other papers that we've spoken about uh, um, tonight or today and looking at uh, there's a lot that goes into making an anatomic arthroplasty work for a proximal humerus fracture and maybe reverse is the solution that, that we were looking for. Right. Yeah. Just, just like you were saying, you know, for the verses, you don't necessarily need um, healing of the tuberosities per se, and uh, you don't need a functioning rotator cuff. Um, but again, one of the things that you mentioned and I mentioned earlier, it was mentioned again, is that uh, you do need a function axillary nerve and a, and a deltoid in order to make uh, these reverses happen. So I think it's uh, important to examine these patients, uh, you know, preoperatively to see if they have any palsies. And uh, if they do, you know, possibly get an EMG, if they do have a palsy, or if you see a lot of atrophy of their, um, of their deltoid muscle, uh, they may not, the, those patients may not do as good um, with a reverse shoulder arthroplasty uh, if they had these, you know, three, four part proximal humerus fractures. But again, a uh, good, good review of this paper. Great paper. Yeah, I totally agree, especially too, if, right, if they have a fracture dislocation and we're expecting an axillary nerve palsy, is it something that's going to resolve in a few days? Or is it something like you said that we need to work up further? Because yeah, nothing, uh, nothing would be worse than uh, taking a decent sized schwack out of somebody's uh, shoulder only to find out that their axillary nerve is uh, not wanting to wake back up. And then you really have dug yourself quite the hole. Yeah. All right. Soon to be Dr. Sandler will wrap us up with our last, uh, last paper for the, for the episode here. Okay, perfect. Our second locking plate paper. So this one is a study by Sudkamp et al. titled Open Reduction and Internal Fixation of Proximal Humerus Fractures with Use of the Locking Proximal Humerus Plate. It was published in JBJS in 2009. 
So th this one was actually published only two years after the Gardner study, which was 2007. And we are still looking into the humoral phase, which is really cool. And it's cool to see this progression too. So we have heard this quarter sort of background from the other studies, but the treatment for displaced and unstable proximal humerus fractures continued to be controversial. And there were concerns for implant failure, loss of reduction, non-union, malunion, impingement, osteonecrosis, et cetera. Um, so with ORIF specifically, patients with osteopenia and comminuted fractures did continue to have notably unpredictable results. And this is a really big deal, considering that over 70% of patients with proximal humerus fractures are over 60 and 75% of patients are female, meaning that baseline osteopenia is expected, which I think we've kind of brought up at almost every paper we've discussed now. Um, while locking plates are known to have a biomechanical advantage in dealing with osteoporotic bone, there still weren't that many studies that described outcomes. And this leads us into the purpose of this study, to understand outcomes and complications after ORIF using a locking proximal humerus plate. So this study was a prospective observational study, including 187 patients that presented to nine internationally located trauma units. Patients who were eligible for inclusion met indications for operative criteria, either near 45 degrees or of angulation or one centimeter displacement, or were unstable on passive motion under C-arm. And this study was actually a little more exclusive than some of the other ones we've seen, most likely because they were at nine large trauma units and had to uh, weed pay more patients out than some of the other smaller studies. So they excluded patients with a prior proximal humerus surgery, concomitant ipsilateral distal humerus or elbow injury, polytrauma with an ISS of over 16, uh, any sort of disorders that affected healing, and post-traumatic brachial plexus injury or peripheral nerve palsy. So we've discussed locking plates a bit as well uh, in the last study, but since this study was specific to a single synthesis locking plate designed by the AO Foundation, I'll add a couple things. Um, these are either five or eight hold plates that are contoured to the lateral proximal humeral metaphysis and diaphysis. And there are two types of screws incorporated in order to increase angular stability, a multi-directional locking screw for the humeral head, and then the combination holes that can accommodate either locking or non-locking screws in the shaft. There are also smaller holes that can be used for wire or suture fixation of the tuberosities. And the authors describe a couple of important advantages to these plates, including high resistance to avulsion in osteoporotic bone, the potential for early exercise and short mobilization, which is attributed to the increased initial stability after fixation, and more elasticity than other implants that decreases load and theoretically will increase long-term stability. So for surgical technique, uh, the deltopectoral approach was used in 85% of patients who presented to seven of the nine hospitals, and then the deltoid splitting approach in the other two hospitals. The fractures were reduced, stabilized with K-wires and confirmed by imaging, and the plates were positioned five to eight millimeters distal to the upper end of the greater tuberosity and two millimeters posterior to the bicipital groove. Uh, and the authors noted they were very careful not to impinge on the groove. After adequate fixation, um, angular stable screws were used to secure the plate to the humeral head, and then either angular stable or standard cortical screws were used in the shaft at the surgeon's discretion. And final imaging was also obtained at the surgeon's discretion. So as you can kind of see here, there's a bit of surgeon discretion. The study is unique in that in including nine trauma centers and 10 surgeons, we kind of have some like individuality on behalf of each of the surgeons. And it could be argued that this adds variability to the study, but it also kind of just like an epidemiological account sort of of how these fractures were managed. Um, and it seems like it really increases the generalizability of the results to how uh, proximal humerus and locking plates are happening in the world at the time. So moving into the results, as expected, 72% of patients were female with an average age of 67 compared to the average age of 52 for their male counterparts. A majority of fractures were classified as B1 on the Muller AO classification system, which is of course frequently used for research purposes, um, meaning that they were bifocal and extra articular and had metaphyseal impaction. A five hole plate was used in 90% of patients and an eight hole plate in 10%. Plate independent lag screws were used in 17% and suture fixation of the tuberosity was actually performed in a majority of patients at 59%. As you would likely guess, there were significant differences between the operative time required for each of the different AO fracture categories with the articular C-type fractures taking the longest at 124 minutes and the bifocal extra-articular B-type fractures taking the shortest at 84 minutes. So for outcomes, both range of motion and constant scores increased significantly over the follow-up period with no significant differences between the fracture types. From three to 12 months, absolute constant score increased from 53 to 71, which is actually a jump from 63% to 85% of the function of the uninjured contralateral side. And then complication and reoperation rates were actually pretty high. So a third of patients experienced complications and a fifth underwent unplanned reoperation. Over half of complications were directly related to the index surgical procedure, and 60% occurred during the first three months. 
So the two most common primary complications were related to surgical technique. 14% of patients had a primary screw perforation of the humeral head that wasn't noted during surgery, and four had subacromial impingement due to plates being placed too high. Over half of reoperations were due to secondary screw perforation. Four patients underwent infected related revision, four underwent repeat osteosynthesis after plate breakage or screw pullout, three were had exchange for shorter screws, and three were converted to arthroplasty. So getting into conclusions, the authors kind of wrap all this up by noting that the locking proximal humerus plates have reliable results when used correctly with a really big emphasis on the when used correctly portion. A third of patients will have complications, but 40% of these were already present by the end of the case. And the authors really reiterate that proper technique could have prevented them. And then with this in mind, the authors also recommend a final C-arm shot at the end of the case with rotation of the humeral head for his final screw placement check. And this, of course, was in the study obtained at the surgeon's discretion. So now for what makes this special, this study really reiterates that locking plates offer a viable option in treating proximal humerus fractures, but the importance of good technique and screw placement in achieving acceptable outcomes cannot be overstated. Yeah, I, I thought you absolutely nailed the main takeaways from that study. And in my kind of notes on it, I circled and starred and highlighted the, the one point you brought up, which was that 40% of these complications were present before they ever left the operating room. And um, you have to give credit to the authors for being uh, transparent enough and willing to, to, to state that. A lot of times in, in studies today, there's either spin or, or ossification of results where <clears throat> you're not sure if the authors actually are reporting their um, outcomes either you know transparently or, or fully accurately. But for them to come out and say this, you really have to give respect to them because they're recognizing that there's a major limitation that people can learn from, um, from their mistakes. And uh, in addition, bringing up the fact that there were a lot of um, you know generalized or discretion of the surgeon type comments. I think that in a study like this, when you're just looking at a, um, a single technique, I think it increases the strength of the study personally. I think when you're comparing two techniques, you have to try to minimize any variability between the two techniques and, this, and, and preference and things like that to allow for a pure comparison. But I think in observational studies, it really does increase the strength of it because um, you're not taking the one surgeon who does 5,000 of these cases over 10, you, you know, you're taking a smattering of uh, trauma surgeons at trauma centers. So people who know what they're doing for sure, but they have their own little nuances to how they do the case. And you're allowing for that to, I think, more accurately capture kind of a slice of the surgeons at the time and how they were treating these. So um, I'm, I'm glad you brought both those points up, but I think that if anything, this really allows us to capture what was going on at the time and where the mistakes were being made. Yeah, 100%. And I think something that was really interesting too, is that between those nine hospitals, the authors actually looked at if there were any statistically significant differences in outcomes, which again, is another thing I really respect about this paper. I think I had the same thought that you had initially was like, wow, I'm glad people were willing to report, you know, less than perfection. Um, Cause that's clearly what's going on at the time. And there weren't any statistically significant differences and they didn't have enough power to say that there were statistical similarities, but there were definitely no differences. So I think that was really interesting too. Yeah. I mean, you guys, again, nailed it on the head. You know, I don't have anything else to add. You did a great job going over this, uh, Alexis, and, and the point uh, uh, that you made, John. I mean, yeah, a good paper, you know, a good study. You know, I can see definitely why, you know, this is, has been cited so many times. And, you know, it's very interesting to see these highest um, cited papers, a couple having to do with, you know, fixing it with open reduction, as well as placement of our um, medial support. And then, you know, these other papers um, talking about reverse shoulder arthroplasty, and then I'm talking about kind of um, factors for um, hemiarthroplasty. And I mean, I think this is a, a great um, episode, great review on uh, on proximal humerus fracture, at least the, the five highest um, cited articles. Uh, I mean, great job, y'all. Thank you. Yeah, I I think what really the what these these five tend to like if I were to summarize all of them and look at them, what we're realizing is that there's a lot that goes into an appropriate open reduction internal fixation of a proximal humerus fracture. There's a lot that goes into an appropriately done anatomic shoulder arthroplasty. But what we've come to find in the literature, and there's a lot of nuances to reverses that we're learning more and more. But if you look at the, at least at like the 30,000 foot view, uh, reverses do have uh, 
they have more forgiveness built into them with, with regards to certain um, either positioning or indication type of um, components to planning for the surgery. Tuberosities don't heal. Ah, they'll probably do okay. We don't repair the subscap. Ah, that's probably okay. Oh, they have uh, a low degree of notching. Yeah, it's bad at a year and doesn't really get worse from there and didn't really impact outcomes. It's um, you can see why if you were a, a fledgling either trauma or upper extremity surgeon in the you know 2010 or 2011, you have a patient with a displaced proximal humerus fracture. You look at the hurdle criteria and maybe they're a, a split between going on to develop ischemia or to be perfused. And uh, you're thinking, well, do I want to do this ORAF where I have to have my medial support? I have to have my inferior medial screw. I have to uh, make sure that I get appropriate imaging before I leave the OR because there's close to a coin flip chance that I'm going to have a complication before I ever step foot out of the OR. Or do I make a good head cut, be careful reaming the glenoid, put it in a reverse. The patient may already have a rotator cuff tear and I'm probably setting them up to do pretty well. And uh, it really, uh, you can see how it drove research then for the next 10 to 15 years afterwards. But um, it's amazing how in these two episodes we've done, at the conclusion, I even gained more respect for the studies and more respect for what um, these authors had all done. And, and it really helped helps to kind of drive the next 10 to 15 years of research. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. Um, you know, again, great job, y'all. I mean, each episode uh, has been um, great. You know, uh, I learned a lot just listening on on these different episodes. And I'm thinking maybe only two or three of these articles that, that we've talked about over the past two, I had actually read beforehand. So it was great to see, you know, kind of in-depth summaries of all these different um, articles. I'm looking forward to the next episode already. Uh, you know, you guys are, are, are crushing it. Oh, thanks for having us. It's been awesome. And it's uh, been great to be a part of this. Thank yeah, you so for, much. Definitely a huge privilege. Oh, yes. And for those of you that are listening, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Go and leave a review and let us know um, how much you enjoyed this episode. We talked some good stuff about proximal humerus fractures, one of our good amount of high yield um, papers. And if you have any suggestions for, uh, for topics, feel free to reach out to us as well. Uh, without further ado, we will uh, hear you and see you next episode.